So, I'm running for governor. Ballots due on August 6th. Register to vote so you can get them. Uh, and I hope to win your support, uh, whether I already have it uh, or whether you're just hearing about it right now. So, please, um, please check it out. Please reach out if you have questions. Um, and you can see if you go to the About section, there is a contact page. And you'll see that you can use this contact form or you can just email publicstackhouseplusinfo at gmail.com. But that is the Stackhouse for Governor campaign. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and answer a few questions uh, that came in. So um, the person who emailed requested to remain anonymous, but I'm going to go ahead and read these questions anyway and do my best to answer them. So first one, as a lesbian and transgender individual, I'm happy with a lot of the protections against discrimination afforded to myself when it comes to working and finding housing, as well as the extremely necessary access to medical care. I would like to confirm that those protections would not be going anywhere if you were to become governor, at least to the best of your ability. Do you have plans to strengthen and maintain those protections? So let me start by saying that I'm running for governor and it is my intention to not scale back any protections um, or, uh, you know, I I'm not trying to scale back anyone, anyone's rights or protections, legal protections. Um, and so, yes, my plan is 100% to uh, strengthen and maintain these protections. And uh, I really put the emphasis on strengthen. So I tend to believe that um, that we need to be expanding our rights in general to more people and also to more reliably have those rights ourselves. So when it comes to transgender care, I look at this as uh, um, something that needs to be expanded as part of our general expansions to health care. So right now, yes, you have a right to health care. You have a right to gender transition care, but many people just can't afford it. Um, universal health care is not just, you know, an affirmation of your right to these things, but saying we need to make this, we need to remove the economic barriers so you have the practical ability to pursue these things, not just the theoretical right. Um, so whether we're talking about that housing guarantee or uh, the, you know, universal healthcare system, the idea is this is going to ensure that you not only have a right to these things, but that you're able to, you um, to pursue them as much as you need, whether or not uh, you have the economic means to do so today. So next question. I found that when traversing the medical system with state-sponsored health care, it is difficult to maintain my dignity as a trans person, requiring myself to be outed by my legal name constantly. Oftentimes, they hand wave me when I ask them to use my preferred name, stating that they, quote, legally must state it, unquote, uh, when interacting. This, I believe, is dishonest, and while I'm no lawyer, I've had no success in finding the law that would require that. What, if anything, are your plans for maintaining and affirming the dignity of trans people traversing government systems in the companies that accept government funding? So, I'm not aware of this law either. I am also not a lawyer. So, um, I think the first thing that we need to really do is determine what the law says about this. Um, and certainly, I don't think that doctors or hospitals should be um, stating any kind of legal requirement unless it truly is a legal requirement. Um, if it is a legal requirement, then, you know, they're just doing their jobs and, you know, maybe that's a law that we can look into and change. And I think the first thing we would need to understand is what exactly the law is, uh, who made it, why it's there, how long it's been there, and make sure that if we amend this law to address this issue, that we don't accidentally create another issue that, you know, we were trying to avoid. So, um, for instance, uh, if this is your legal name, uh, I would understand why, for instance, on paperwork, it might be important to have the legal name written down. Um, but that doesn't mean that the legal, you know, the paperwork couldn't also include a preferred name, right? Um, it, it's relevant information. Uh, I also think that um, while uh, there may be certain circumstances in which to receive medical consent, it's important to make sure that the correct legal name was used to make sure there's no confusion about who's being referred to. Uh, I think that in many, if not most, interactions with a healthcare provider, there shouldn't really be a problem in using one's preferred name. And, in, you know, I'm sure that 
uh, Christophers get called Chris all the time when they're talking to their doctor. So I, I think that, you know, we can expand that to the case of um, people who may prefer a different name because of their gender transition. Okay, next question. One thing that I've personally found vexing is the difficulty in changing my legal name, mainly the length of time and cost. While it is significantly better than my previous home state of Texas, I am not a wealthy individual by any means. So the cost is difficult to cover, and even with the waiver of cost form, it requires a level of means testing that is rather upsetting. I understand that this specific thing would be of low priority to a campaign. However, if you do have plans to change this, what do you plan to do that will lower or eliminate means testing when it comes to those who need help paying their way through legal processes like name changes and the like? And what, if anything, can be done about arbitrary wait times like the 30-day mandatory wait if you pay with anything other than cash? So uh, I don't happen to know a ton about this process, um, but I don't really say, and, and by the way, it's not in my platform specifically, uh, but that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, I wouldn't do anything about this as governor. Um but uh, I guess what I'll say is I don't see any reason why it should cost very much money at all to change one's name. Uh, in my opinion, for something like that, I can't think of a great reason to have anything other than a nominal fee. Um, but, uh, you know, wait times, I think that there might be reasons for wait times. But again, I don't see why there would be a wait time if you pay with card, but not a wait time if you pay with cash, you know, in my opinion. Uh, if it's arbitrary, um, if it's, you know, we shouldn't use wait times to encourage you to pay in a certain way. It should be it costs a certain amount. The wait time is what it is and pay for it with legal money and we're good. Um, now, you know, would I remove these fees? I think, I think potentially we would look into that. We'd see uh, what these fees, you know, how high they are um, and how we could raise the, the money um, you know, if necessary. Uh, I, I can't imagine that this costs the system very much, um, but I don't think that fees are really the best way to collect that kind of money. And in general, I'm not a fan of means testing. I think that uh, services should be free and universal. Um, and the only fees, wait periods, all of these things, these should only be in place to prevent abuse. So, um, I don't consider a, uh, a person going through gender transition and changing their name. This is common. This is not a form of abuse. Um, and it should really be, uh, you know, this is not an area, it's, it's hard enough to transition. Um, so we don't need to make changing one's name uh, adding to that difficulty. Um, on the other hand, I don't think we want people changing their names all the time for no reason. Um, and I think that, you know, we don't, you know, there are, there are reasons for this, right? Uh, I think that people have good reasons for changing their name, but if they're doing it because they're a con artist or they're trying to do tax evasion, um, that's not something that we need to protect. So um, I think that, you know, most people who, who have sincere reasons for changing their name tend to only do it a few times in their life. Um, and that is something that shouldn't really be too much difficulty for the state to handle. It shouldn't cost the individual that much money. Um, and I think that from what you describe, we could probably do a lot better on that. And then last question, what are your plans on the off chance that you win the election for governor and Trump wins the presidential election to protect the citizens from the sweeping changes planned by their, their Project 2025 proposal and all their planned cuts to public funds and protections? Well, Project 2025 is a multifaceted attack on our democracy. And so I think that the only way to push back against it is a multifaceted expansion to democracy. Um, and I've already touched on that in a number of ways, right? I'm saying that we need to expand our right to health care, expand our right to housing. And, and a major theme of my campaign is that Washington state cannot, um, cannot rely on the federal government to deliver the kind of funding for the kind of society that we want to live in. It has been something that the federal government has failed to do my entire life. Um, and I think we need to stop accepting uh, excuses from politicians saying, well, the, that needs federal funding, that, you know, we can only do that with the federal government. Uh, I reject that. I think that there really is nothing that Washington state couldn't do. Um, in my opinion, we have the population and economy of a major nation. Um, 
There, we are every bit as rich as the sort of large social democracies of, of say, Europe. Um, so there's no reason we couldn't have the same level of infrastructure and, and uh, public programs. Um, and I think that if we take the steps to make those a reality in Washington, then we won't have to worry so much about when these are being scaled back federally. Yes, uh, our federal representatives... Um, and our state government should be pushing back against these things. And I, I don't think we need to just accept federal policy at face value. So, for instance, Washington state is a state that has legalized cannabis, something I'm very supportive of. Um, and cannabis remains illegal at the federal level. But we found that we were able to legalize it here and it's worked out pretty well. Um, and I think that on other issues like, say, marriage equality, you know, marriage equality is something that we were a leader on in Washington. And so even if that gets scaled back federally, it would remain legal in Washington. And that is that is a good thing. Um, and uh, and I think we've seen this, you know, yet another time recently with the uh, repeal of Roe v. Wade, you know, and, and for many states and many people that has created limitations on their access to reproductive care. But in Washington, you know, abortion was legal before Roe v. Wade, and then it remains legal after the repeal of Roe v. Wade. So that is really the direction that we need to go, is expanding our our rights and our democracy. And um, if you scroll to the bottom of my platform page, you'll actually see a pretty comprehensive um, democracy expansion plank to my platform. So I, I encourage you to look into it. You know, we can introduce things like ranked choice voting so that we elect our representatives through a more democratic voting system. Um, we can uh, expand uh, people's ability to vote through things like election day as a holiday. Um, we can do public campaign finance. We can strengthen our ballot initiative process. So there are many ways in which we can kind of put the people more in charge of the state um, and, and push back against reactionary and corporate interests. So thank you for writing in with those questions. Again, if you want to write into the campaign, it's publicstackhouse plus info at gmail.com um, or just publicstackhouse at gmail.com. Just helps me stay organized if you use that info alias. Um, and before I sign off today, I just want to say if you like what you see here and you want to take the first step towards showing your support, uh, go to publicstackhouse.org slash pledge, and you can fill out this pledge to vote uh, form to let me know that you're planning on voting for me. Um, and I can uh, help make sure that, you know, you get your ballot and it gets sent in. And it just helps me know that I've got support out there and strategize the rest of my campaign. So you can do it from your phone um, or your computer. It's really easy to do. It takes like two seconds. Um, and that is the easiest way to support this campaign. The second easiest way to support this campaign would then be to share the link uh, and tell a friend, hey, uh, I heard about this pretty cool campaign for governor. I pledged to vote for it, and I think you should too. So publicstackhouse.org slash pledge. Please fill out the pledge to vote. Uh, if you're not in Washington, um, that's fine, uh, but you know you can still volunteer. You can still donate. There's lots more ways to get involved. Um, but word of mouth, word of mouth is key to getting out the vote on this. So please um, don't just be excited in your head. Don't just keep it um, online. Tell a friend um, and, uh, and help me generate a bit of buzz. So that's it for today. Um, I'm hoping to go live a little bit more often and get a little bit more into the details of what this campaign is, as well as things that aren't related to this campaign. Um, I'm hoping to build a little bit more presence on YouTube here in general um, and, and to build that engaged audience. I want to teach you what's going on and how to really be civically engaged uh, and, and to um, connect with me um, and help me uh, understand what you're interested in and how I can advance that in Washington's politics. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, I wish you all the best and um, till the next time. All right. Night, everyone.